There's 120,000 patients right now waiting for an organ transplant. So today we're going to be... There's 120,000 patients right now waiting for an organ transplant. So today we're going to be 3D printing an ear. Our goal here is to develop technology which allow us to take CO2 back out of the atmosphere and do something with it. The bottom line is we're going to get to a place in the world one day where the majority of the meat made didn't require killing or confining a single animal. Our population will be 9.2 billion people by 2050. We're going to require 70% more food than it is produced today. Kelp is the next kale. It's a superfood. The single biggest limiting step, it's not the technology, it's not the funding, I don't think it's even the consumer adoption. It's regulatory. Right now, pepperoni pizza is regulated by the Department of Agriculture, whereas cheese pizza is regulated by the FDA. The rate of technological progress has proceeded at such a pace that the regulatory state has no way to adjust. I made Ian into chicken nuggets, and I was eating Ian while Ian was walking around on the ground. We found a way to create food without causing death. Who's being threatened by new meat? answer the producers of old meat. Nothing could be further from the truth than the idea that big businesses don't like regulation. Big businesses love regulation. The number of startups is way down in the United States. It's fallen by about 50% since the 1980s. You'll never get a permit for even shellfish aquaculture in California. They haven't issued any new permits in 22 years. One thing that regulation's got to do is that it's got to be intrinsically reasonable. There's a beautiful simplicity to that. That's probably why it will never be adopted by Congress. If you have one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, you're not going anywhere. We have to make sure that we allow opportunities to flourish and grow. Let's let a thousand flowers. One of my favorite quotes is, be ashamed to die until you've won some victory for humanity. I've been looking for a victory, and I think we found it. Hello. I hope that you enjoyed that trailer, and thank you for joining us for today's discussion of the documentary film, they say it can't be done, which shows how entrepreneurs are advancing technological solutions in areas as diverse as aquaculture, 3D printed human organs, cultured meat, and carbon capture. If you registered for this event, then you received an email with a link and password to watch the full length documentary. 
And if you did not register, then you can still find the link and password to watch the full documentary by visiting cato.org slash live. The link and password will be posted in the chat box. Our hashtag is Cato Events for those of you joining via social media. My name is Chelsea Follett and I am a policy analyst in Cato's Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, as well as managing editor of humanprogress.org, a website that chronicles with data the tremendous progress that humanity has made and that seeks to spur intelligent debate about the policies and institutions that foster progress. The documentary film that is the topic of our forum today explores how innovation can solve some of the world's greatest problems and promote human progress. The film tracks four companies on the cutting edge of technological innovations that could help to protect the seas from pollution, solve hunger, eliminate organ transplant wait lists, and reduce atmospheric carbon emissions. The documentary also explores how in the fast paced world of technological development, well-intentioned regulations can inadvertently hamper beneficial discoveries. Each company in the film has the potential to solve some of humanity's greatest challenges, but all face a common roadblock, a restrictive bureaucracy impeding their pathways to success. I am pleased to introduce the film's lead producer, Patrick Reasonover. He previously produced the award-winning feature-length documentary of Dogs and Men. He is co-creator and producer on an animated comedy web series based on the New York Times best-selling book series, The Politically Incorrect Guides, also to be released in fall 2019. Through his work with corporate partners, Patrick has produced more than 300 animated documentary, virtual reality, and narrative projects. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Emory University in creative writing and philosophy. And you can follow his latest documentary on Twitter at It Can't Be Done Doc. We are delighted to also have Johan Norberg join us. Johan is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a writer who focuses on globalization, entrepreneurship, and individual liberty. Johan's articles and opinion pieces appear regularly in both Swedish and international newspapers, and he is a regular commentator and contributor on television and radio around the world discussing globalization and free trade. Johan is the author and editor of several books exploring liberal themes, including Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future, named by The Economist as one of the best books of 2016. In November of this year, his latest book, Open, the Story of Human Progress, will be released in the United States. Prior to joining Cato, Johan was head of political ideas at Timbro, a Swedish free market think tank from 2003 to 2005. He then served as a senior fellow for the Brussels-based Center for a New Europe during 2006. Johan received his master's degree from Stockholm University in the history of ideas. After their discussion, our speakers will be taking questions from you, the audience. You can submit questions via our event webpage through Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, please use our event hashtag, Cato Events, to make sure that we see your questions. Feel free to start posting your questions before the Q&A begins. We'll get to as many as we can. So without further ado, Patrick will now start us off by giving us, uh, by telling us some more about the documentary and its background, to be followed by a dialogue with Johan, and then we will start taking questions. Fantastic. <clears throat> well, thank you, Chelsea, and thank you to everyone who watched our film uh, or who will soon watch it from the link. Uh, we have a great team. I just happen to be sitting here, but there's no way I could have made this documentary by myself. Uh, so just want to start out with some thank yous to Andrea Fuller, you know, fellow producer, Victoria Hill, fellow producer, Michael Ozias, director of the film, as well as Dan Hanna, our fantastic editor, and Ben Gaskell 
our, our DP cinematographer. Uh, there are just some great people behind this film. And, you know, we, on behalf of them all, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for watching us and also thank Cato. Uh, if you have been to Cato or work at Cato, you might have recognized some of the backgrounds in the film. Uh, so definitely want to thank Clark Neely, Peter Van Doren, and the Cato Events team for letting us uh, shoot there uh, as we were making this film. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, this, you know, the kind of thinking behind the film. So our approach to documentary is to start with a question and then go on a journey through the film, uh, you know, connecting these ideas to, you know, emotions and people's experience in the world. And then to end on a deeper, more profound question than we began with, one that you can only reach by going on that journey. So our approach is not to turn the film into a syllogism or to be a paper that you watch or you read through and see a conclusion. It's more meant to make you reflect upon uh, yourself and who you are and your ideas and, and the truth, what you believe. Uh, so coincident with that approach, what we do is we're approaching this subject matter, something like innovation and regulation, which was what we started with. You know, we won a grant with the Federalist Society, who was a fantastic partner on this film, uh, to to tell a, a story about innovation and regulation. So when you're you're you know you're looking to tell a story about two ideas, uh, it's very challenging. Uh, people are not going to necessarily rush out to the theater to watch uh, a regulation, a feature film on regulation. So what we did is we dove in and just said, what is of interest here? What really is going to motivate audiences and, and, you know, make it worth their, you know, hour and a half to, to pay attention. And so what we decided upon was to focus on, since we have innovation, what are some problems innovators are looking into? Because the problems the innovators are looking into is something that, you know, would be shared with our audience, people who, who look at hunger, uh, you know, providing cheap and, and, you know, healthy protein to a global pop, growing global population, uh, atmospheric carbon, global warming, uh, ocean acidification, uh, rising healthcare costs. Uh, these are all problems, no matter what, you know, ideology or background you come from, uh, that you, we all know that, that, you know, we're, we're grasping with, we're grappling with. And so what we wanted to do is pick some of these problems and go look for innovators to see if there are indeed market solutions to these problems. Because often, you know, from the media, uh, <clears throat> at least from my standpoint, we see whenever these problems are announced or discussed, there is, you know, somehow an encumbrance that the government be the one to solve it and one big centralized plan. Uh, but we thought it would be interesting to see if through the decentralized system of the market, whether there were innovators out there who, if their innovation was taken to scale, uh, would it impact or solve these problems? And uh, the films, uh, the, the folks that you see in the film are, are representative. So by no means the only people working in these fields or companies in these fields, there are, they're representative of them. And, uh, and it was just really an honor uh, to be uh, allowed to go into the facilities where these people are working and talk with them about their vision. And I just wanted to relay, uh, you know, kind of a couple takeaways when bringing us back to regulation. So with the film, we wanted to see, are these innovators able to bring their product to market? Are there barriers to entry? Are those barriers to entry regulatory in nature in the sense that uh, the current regulatory apparatus is, is throwing up barriers or blocking them, or perhaps there's something more that the regulatory agency needs to do. And when we looked at regulation, we took a very broad view of it. So in a, in, from our standpoint, the standpoint of the film, property rights is a form of, of regulation. So it's, you know, we don't talk about regulation as though it's purely a command and control regulation where Congress passes an act and then they create an agency or they provide new rules for that agency and the agency is going to say these are this is what you can and cannot do and then we're going to enforce uh you know that proclamation uh and penalize you if you don't 
uh, for us, that's a form of regulation, but, uh, you know, for markets to work, we need, we need other kinds of regulations such as, such as property rights. And so, you know, we wanted to just take a big, a big, a big look at the whole sphere of what tools regulators could deploy and just basically test our regulatory system and see, you know, is it helping or is it harming, uh, these innovators and what, what can be done to, to change the situation. And one of the things I found, uh, you know, just personally going in is you might start with a presumption, especially if you come in with, you know, sympathies towards a kind of free market view of the world, that there's a story that's Mr. Bad Guy Regulator is sitting up there in Washington in his desk chair uh, or her desk chair looking to make life miserable for innovators out there wishing you know, secretly they could have done it. And uh, that the poor put upon, you know, companies are all out here just suffering under their thumb. Uh, but in fact, the story we found is much more complicated than that. There's not necessarily super villains sitting in bureaucracies in Washington, D.C. Uh, more often, uh, or at a, really at a deeper, uh, at a deeper place, which is why we titled our film, They Say It Can't Be Done. There's really these two forces that, that are, that are within us all, optimism and pessimism. And so when it comes to something like cell cultured meat, uh, you, you have crony corporations and trade associations, uh, you know, like the American Cattle Association or the Cattlemen's Associations that are trying to prevent this product from coming to market or, or damage it by saying it's not meat. You can't market it as meat, even though it literally scientifically and chemically is meat. Um, so there's crony corporations involved. There's also, you know, Congress has to act to put tools in the hands of regulators or restrain them from using tools that they're currently deploying if they don't, you know, want them to be doing it. And then those Congress people are ultimately this uh, subject to the voters. And so to the extent that you yourself allow the pessimism, the, the, the view that sort of mankind is a pernicious, uh, you know, I don't know, virus upon planet Earth and that our activities are, you know, not life promoting and are not progress. And that when we see these big problems that come about from human activity, we just need to stop. We need to limit. There needs to be less activity. There needs to be less innovation. There should be fewer people. Then you're really giving in to something that's, you know, really exacerbated and, and um, promoted by our, our media. Uh, but it's it's really it really is at base you giving in to this belief that that that's the way mankind is. Uh, there's another part of us. Uh, the optimist who can look out at strangers we don't know, uh, pe like the people in the film that you you know, had the opportunity to spend some time with, uh, these innovators, and see what they're doing. Just what is the human mind um, and its imagination capable of? Uh, especially when you have a lot of minds collaborating together to do amazing things. And then when you think about those problems, when you've embraced that optimistic part of yourself. There's sort of a sense that no matter what we face, even if we create, we're part of the problem that we've created, that we can solve it. And it do, it's not going to come from a centralized, mandated place, because the only way you can solve problems is by having local information and a lot of different imaginations coming up with new ideas and competing to succeed. And so, Really, when it comes to innovation and regulation, they're, they're tied together hand in hand. Uh, there needs to be basic regulations and traditions for innovators to bring a product to market, to patent it, to brand it, to offer it available in you know, stores, to have contract law and courts. Uh, however, the, to the extent that regulation uh, stands in the way of this, it's standing in the way of the power of the decentralized human imagination all over the world, interacting and collaborating with one another to discover solutions that, you know, maybe solve problems without even intending to. Um, as you can see in the film, just one example of this would be, you know, if cell cultured meat 
uh, is able in the future to sort of be the way that we uh, consume protein, uh, not through you know um, you know factory farms or just animal uh, human husbandry, animal husbandry, and slaughter. That <clears throat> we have a lot of collide, you know, sort of um, domino effects, where two thirds of arable land is used to grow food to feed those animals currently. Um, there's water usage, there's waste products from those animals. Those animals are given antibiotics. Uh, so we almost see an immediate environmental impact just by shifting to a system like that. And I think the beauty of it and the magic of it is, you know, is really embodied in, you know, one of the quotes Josh Tetris gave us in the film, which is that, you know, they're not necessarily a company setting out to do good. They're a company setting out to make a, you know, a, the best damn hamburger you ever ate at the lowest price. And when they have that motivation, they're able to do good. So I hope you enjoyed the film and I'm very, you know, eager to hear your questions. And I'm also eager to hear from Johan. Thank you so much, Patrick. Johan will now give his comments before we go to Q&A. A reminder to our audience to please uh, submit your questions via our event webpage through Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube using the hashtag Cato events so that we see them. You don't have to wait for the Q&A to submit questions. Um, I think you are on mute, Johan. Would you unmute? Um, and at the top of your screen, there is a microphone icon. If you click that, you should unmute. If that's not working, you can also refresh the link that you used to get in. Um, so just leave and come back with the link. Okay, we'll wait one more moment. Uh, again, I just want to use this opportunity to remind people um, that you can submit your questions through the events webpage, through Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube using the hashtag Cato events. We'll get to as many of those as possible. And uh, again, don't uh, feel that you need to wait until the Q&A to submit your questions. If you submit them now, uh, we will get to them during the Q&A. Welcome back. So, hey, does it work better this time? Yes. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much for your patience. That was a little trick to show you all how much we depend on the innovators and the entrepreneurs and the engineers to make the world work in an excellent way. Uh, so thank you, Chelsea, so much. And thank you, Patrick. And congratulations. Uh, I'm doing, on a regular basis, documentaries myself. So I think I know what I'm talking about when I say that this is a great film. Um, it is very well done. It's an important topic. And I love the use of the Team America Thunderbirds puppets, which is really clever, I think. Uh, but I also have to say that I watch it with mixed emotions. And I think that that's probably your intent as well, because it's a powerful description of what happens when the unstoppable force of human imagination and creativity meets the immovable object of government regulation. We meet these amazing entrepreneurs and innovations with tremendous potential to improve the world and all our lives and to protect the planet, and yet also rules and regulations that stop them at every turn. So it's really mixed emotions. It's like bringing a kid to a candy store, but saying that he can't have me. And I don't have to dwell on the particular examples in the film. You have probably all seen it. If you haven't, congratulations, because you have 90 great minutes ahead of you. So here I would just like to distill and focus on some of the lessons and the things that I thought about when I watched this film. So first of all, um, in my new book, my forthcoming book, Open the Store of Human Progress that Chelsea mentioned, I point out that innovation comes from surprises 
and accidents, from strange places, from weird combinations, from eccentrics and entrepreneurs, and it cannot be foreseen and it cannot be planned for. From the steam engine to the personal computer to present innovations, we see this pattern of innovations coming from strange places where we didn't expect them to. Robotics just solved the ancient problem of simultaneous localization of the robot and mapping by learning from gaming and gaming companies. Newspapers and retailers learned secure online payments and video streaming from porn sites. So it comes from surprises and strange combinations. And the problem is that nobody really likes surprises because we all try to get what we are doing all the time to work. We're trying to get our old business model to work. Politicians try to get their social and economic model to work. And they don't want anyone to disrupt that. And that's an age old problem. The economist and historian Joel Moker talks about Cardwell's after the technology historian Donald S. Cardwell. And Cardwell's law says that even the best of cultures, even in the golden eras, they tend to move towards an absorbing barrier of technological stagnation. Because innovation always faces resistance from groups that think that they stand to lose from it for one reason or the other, another. Be they old political or religious elites or business incumbents with old technologies or workers with outmoded skills could be nostalgic romantics, or just people who are afraid of the risks that come with new technologies. And all these groups have an incentive to stop changes with bans and regulations and monopolies and burning of boats or building of walls. And when they get sufficient power, they block surprises. And that is how every period of openness and innovation in history was ended, except one the one that we're in right now. And for the moment, as is pointed out in this film, it is neck and neck between innovation and regulation, between optimism and pessimism. And the forces of pessimism and of regulation are strong because of two incentives that make this problem of regulation intractable. The incentives for bureaucrats and for businesses. And they are both on wide display in this film. Uh, it's countless examples of these incentives for bureaucrats and for businesses. To, to start with the bureaucrats, it really goes back to uh, Bastia, the French 19th century economist, what is seen and what is not seen. And Clark Neely points this out in the film. You can see the immediate positive effects of regulation and government intervention, but the costs are not seen because they're widespread, dispersed in time and in space, so that you don't see the great thing that could come about from innovation, from new businesses. And this is what every poor bureaucrat, who is not a super villain, as Patrick pointed out, but what every bureaucrat faces whenever they are supposed to decide on whether to give the go ahead or not. And we would face this problem as well if we were in their position. Let's say you're an FDA official looking at a new medical technology or a new drug. You can make two very different mistakes. The first mistake is to approve a drug that turns out to have side effects that result in the death or serious injury to a sizable number of people. That's the first mistake you could make. The other one is that you can refuse approval of a drug that could have saved many lives or relieved great distress without any serious side effects. And the question is, what would you rather do? Which kind of mistake would you rather do? And it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Because in the first instance, you'll see those who are hurt by your approval. You know who they are, or at least journalists know who they are. You live with the consequences and you will get the blame. In the second instance, when you ban this drug, you do not give a go ahead. No one will know who, how many people could have been saved and you don't have to look them in the eye and 
even if you had to, you'd have a perfect excuse. You just wanted to keep everybody safe. We would probably all err on the safe of bans, of, of conservatism. It's obvious, but it's really just based on psychology and the fear of facing blame, because the real consequences of our actions are the same. We hurt people no matter what kind of mistake we do. And often much, much worse when you restrict innovation because we don't live in a perfect world. We need inventions. And so every time the FDA says that they have just approved a new medical technology or a new drug that will save the lives of 20,000 people a year, it really means that they have killed 20,000 people every year that they kept it off the market. But it doesn't feel like it. So regulation will always be extremely conservative unless pushed in the other direction. But unfortunately, it's not pushed in that direction, but on the contrary, in the other direction. And that's partly because of the second incentive, the incentive of businesses. And not businesses in the marketplace, but businesses in the market for regulation. Because if authorities want to minimize risks, corporations want to minimize the risk to their businesses. You know the old truth that monopolies are just like babies. Nobody likes babies until they have their own. And then suddenly it's the best thing on the planet. And it's the same thing with monopolies, obviously. So as the film points out, big business is regulation because they're in a perfect position to handle regulations. The more regulation, the more difficult for new possible entrants in their sector, the fewer competitors. Milton Friedman talked about the natural history of government intervention. And it goes something like this. There is a real evil or a fancied evil that leads to a demand to do something about it. And then there is a coalition between sincere, high-minded reformers that want to keep us all safe and, and equally sincere, interested parties often in business, and they come up with a new law. And the preamble to the law talks about the public interest and the body of the law grants power to government officials to do something. Once this happens, the high-minded reformers, they experience a glow of triumph and they turn their attention to new causes. They move on to the next ambition. And this leaves us with the equally sincere interested parties who stay put and make sure that the regulations are tailored to their old business models, to their processes, to their technologies, to their goods and services, and so keeps the competition away. Because they have the most at stake and they have the most knowledge about these issues and it's worth, worth everything for them to capture the regulatory system. And that's what regulation does. It gives these incumbent businesses a new power that they wouldn't have in the marketplace. So in other words, there are strong incentives and powerful constituencies for old ways of doing stuff. And we see that in the, on proud display in this film. And the only thing that doesn't have a pressure group and a constituency is the future. So we have to be that constituency as individuals, businesses, think tanks, politicians, filmmakers who know what's at stake because we need that space for surprises to make the world safe for progress so again Patrick um, thank you for this wonderful work and please pass on my my gratitude to the whole team showing us what's at stake and making these issues very concrete and convincing and uh, I'll just leave you with this there are many strong and moving stories here about the lives that can be saved through artificial organs, the promise of carbon capture, lab-grown meat that could end cruelty against animals and save lots of land. But if I had to pick just one story, I'd say that the most moving sequence is the entrepreneur working on aquaculture to, who points out that he got into this line of business because he just loves the ocean, being in it, being on a boat and diving and working, thinking about it, and how much he hates the fact that nowadays he rarely gets to go there now, because now he's always stuck behind a computer fighting against bureaucrats for permits. And that got to me. You might not believe in his dream, and it might not work out in the end, but he's devoting his life and risking his fortune to save the planet and improve our lives. So can we at least 
please stop repaying him by making his life miserable. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. Uh, we're now going to go to Q&A. Again, please submit questions via our event's webpage or through Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube using the event's hashtag Cato Events. Uh, so our first question is from Ryan Sullivan on Facebook, and you both may want to answer this one. He says, I love the private sector finding solutions to societal problems. However, as a taxpayer and consumer, the concern is, will these innovations need government subsidies to exist, thus raising taxes? And will it come with higher prices to consumers on goods and services? Um, maybe I can start. So <clears throat> of the four that we featured, um, I think that the answer would be no. Just Foods, with approval, would be ready to launch their product into grocery stores um, around the country. Uh, there's nothing that they need that's a that's government related to do that other than permission. Um, the as for the ocean farming, I mean, to a certain extent, they would need government approval uh, because the oceans are unowned. Uh, other than by the government itself. And so to a certain extent, when you have a commons, there needs to be some means by which that uh, the, those guys can, you know, have, have a space to operate. And uh, so, the, so there definitely is a regulatory aspect that's, that's, that's you know, needs, there needs to be action taken to, to allow them to operate. Um, now, I agree with Johan. I feel like that it is absolutely onerous and the regulatory costs, you know, ultimately subsequent to this film really killed that business. Uh, however, um, you know, there is a role to play. Now, with the carbon capture uh, technology, and it's a very interesting question. We didn't take an approach on whether atmospheric carbon is good or bad or at excess or not in the film. Uh, from our standpoint, it's something that people, you know, large, that many people think. And so we just wanted to see regardless uh, of whatever, wherever that ends. Uh, and that's just not a question we wanted to spend time exploring what with all the other amazing stuff that we could talk about here. Um, Yes, it would be basically we would need a changed approach, not subsidy, but rather than focusing on limiting emissions and going out and checking and uh, fining you if you don't, uh, we would have a, a regime which there could be a market in carbon and then this business could launch uh, you know, almost just like a garbage industry for the commons that is the air. Uh, to a certain extent, that can be framed as a tax uh, on the use of that activity. And uh, that's a big debate we can talk about there. But I mean, some might say, well, you're putting your carbon in the atmosphere and it's a negative and that's a byproduct. And so that, you know, damages the rest of us. It's an externality. And so we need a provision to take care of it. Uh, the final thing would be the health care, uh, the, the health. And so so that you guys know those um, the, the, the cell culture or the sorry, the 3D printed organs is, you know, really still based at university, not fully launched into industry yet. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they're able to, they're only able to fund their work through, uh, to a certain extent, grants from the government, but, uh, but through, you know, relationships with the United States military. I think they're exploring relationships with the NFL Players Association and other groups to help, you know, retired players. Um, no, uh, no, the, the subsidies would not be needed. Um, you know, they wouldn't need to go to only those customers, however, if they were given permission to roll out the technology because then there, there would be a market for it that would fund continued research. Well, the one thing that I would add to this is that um, I wouldn't be too worried about that because the most costly thing is subsidies to ancient technologies that are would have gone out of business had we had innovation in other areas. Um, you know, we're looking at aquaculture here and uh, we have global fishing subsidies at around $35 billion to 
overexploit many of uh, our, our fish stocks out there when it comes to agriculture it's something like 500 billion dollars um so the old industries are heavily subsidized because they are incumbents they've got the constituency they've been lobbying for decades and they've got the power um what we need to the good thing about the new fresh innovations if they're ever allowed to be rolled out is that they are competitive and then they won't need these subsidies thank you our next question is for patrick from flynn parish on youtube who asks uh, would you consider making a documentary about nasa and how in the last 40 years nasa scientists never figured out how to build reusable rocket technology, whereas SpaceX uh, came out with cheaper and better technology. So a similar theme, private uh, sector innovation. Yes. So what we need is a lot of money <laughs> and introduction to Elon Musk. So follow up with me about that and we'll make that documentary. <laughs> um, yes, I feel like there's a lot of innovation in space. Um, we looked at several innovations, including this harvester of micro particles uh, just in Earth orbit to get as a source of rare metals. Uh, we didn't cover those in this film simply because cool as it might be, it wasn't solving an immediate, you know, big popular problem. So some of those cool things like our passenger drone story uh, wound up cut. Makes sense. Our next question. I will direct to Johan. Anonymous asks via our event webpage, what is the best strategy to weaken or abolish regulations that impede innovations that could transform the world? Well, um, first of all, I think the best strategy is to do what Patrick has just done, to try to inform people about these things. The major problem that we're always facing is that some things are seen, concrete, visible here and now, whereas costs of that intervention, that regulation is spread out in time and space. Doing that cost more visible, more concrete to more people is the way to go forward. When innovation it's basically surprises. So only in retrospect, we can show what can be done. Uh, it's very difficult to show what could have been done had the market been more open. But I think this kind of film shows a couple of ideas and to start the thought process of perhaps there are other things out there that could have been made possible if we didn't have this regulatory system. When it comes to what, how to reform it then, um, there are various strategies of uh, trying to make sure that we open up the system uh, even if we didn't dismantle it entirely one of them is i think uh, opening up for more opportunities for people to make informed choices without regulation so that the regulation might be the default option in various areas but if i would like to try this lab grown meat or this medical technology, fully conscious of the fact that it hasn't gone through these 15 years of endless processes, uh, then I would be allowed to do it and I'll sign away my, my right for litigation perhaps uh, and so on. That would create an opening, at least in this regulatory system. Another version is to make sure that the areas and this might, we might have a difference of opinion here. Uh, I noticed in the film that uh, there is a slight um, uh, tendency to argue for state-based regulation in certain areas. I, as much as I like experiments in, uh, in, in uh, regulation as well, I prefer the other uh, way, that we move towards larger and larger areas, uh, which are uh, abide by the same regulations, not to impose one regulation on everybody, one administration on everything, but more like we borrow permits from other places. So that, for example, within the European Union, if the vacuum cleaner uh, or the artificial organ has gone through the German regulatory process, we automatically allow it in Sweden. Uh, 
It's a way of opening up the regulatory system a little bit more, and it's also a way of making sure that regulations aren't entirely tailored to the particular incumbents that you happen to have in your state or in your nation. And I would like to see more countries come to agreements like that. Why shouldn't the European Union and the United States do that, for example? We, none of us have a sort of a lazy fair system or anything like that. I think the average voter uh, in, in the US should be able to trust the German regulatory uh, agency, for example, in, in certain areas. If it's allowed there, shouldn't be automatically allow it in the US as well. That would be another way of opening up for for more options, more experiments. Thank you. Um, we have a question that both of you may want to opine on. Uh, Jonathan Ward on Facebook asks, what is the future for the regulatory environment with the Biden administration? Asking you to predict the future a bit. Um, okay, well, I can go first because I'm sure you want a lot more to say on this. So, number one, I'm a filmmaker, not a policy analyst. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, I get, I, I generally, what I try to do with our film is to relay what we've learned from talking to these people. So, we didn't, we, we didn't know the coronavirus was happening. If we did, we would have included that as a segment of the film for sure. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so I don't know about Biden. But I will say, I want to uh, just hit, uh, you know, exclamation point on something that Johan said, which is that the future has no advocate. And uh, you, we had, uh, you know, Julie Friedman still in the film, those organizations, the World Futurist Society, I knew nothing about futurists. Uh, and uh, the first conversation I had with her was completely bizarre. But after we got to know her and got to know that organization and, you know, the way they think about things, it definitely was an impact on us to, in making the film to think of yourself as an advocate for the future. And I think that's why when, you know, you're looking at pessimism versus optimism and, you know, which one sort of feels right, uh, it's there's a duty perhaps within you as a human being living today to, to keep in mind that you have to be an advocate for the future. And if you do keep that in mind, uh, then it sort of changes how you see things. So the calculus that that, that Johan uh, went through that we that 100 percent is uh, accurate to what you know regulators face, and we talk to them. Uh, but what's missing is that sensibility of the future. You know, it's very present focused, uh, not future focused. The idea that will will can we replicate this, or is this a good idea to just keep doing? In, in a certain sense, you you then you become aware of the costs of indecision or not allowing something uh, that, uh, you know, potentially has risks. Uh, so I yield the floor, Johan, you got Biden. Complicated, I think, than uh, you would normally assume because, um, you know, Trump has tried to portray himself as a deregulatory president and we will obviously see more regulation in several areas under a Biden administration. Although not when it comes to, for example, migration and trade, where the Trump administration has worked hard to regulate uh, business activity and, and uh, people's choices more. Uh, but when it comes to businesses and their everyday activity, there has been this attempted deregulatory push uh, from the Trump administration, which we wouldn't see from Biden. There has been a lot of debate on how much hat and how much cattle has been in this uh, area, because often it has been just, it has not been a new regulatory policy. And this is problematic for the future. It has more like been, let's see how many regulations we can skip and uh, how many we can avoid to implement and let's count them and see what happens and uh, do it through the administrative system through authorities rather than through a legal process which would have been important in the long term and this has meant that we've seen lots of just low-hanging fruit and 
fairly uh, insignificant regulations uh, being abandoned and you know famously uh, the, the uh, department of labor counted as one of their deregulations was that they changed the mailing address to one of their uh, their departments uh, so it's been more bean counting than than revolution uh, but at least they've slowed it down and uh, even if it has sometimes only been paying lip service to deregulation lip service is good it's better than the alternative because that reduces at least the temptation the the joy in constantly uh, regulating more because this is the one area where many governmental authorities are actually have a good pace and high speed and that's implementing new regulations uh, normally it has slowed down a little bit uh, but unfortunately it has not been systematic there's no new governing philosophy no new idea about how to make regulation it's more like being yeah let's be friendly to business particularly the businesses that we happen to like in the administration and um, that means that even if this is the one area where I think that the Trump administration has been uh, less interventionist. It won't stick because there's no real idea behind it, which means that a, under a Trump admini uh, Biden administration, it would be very easy to, to reverse the gains and speed up the regulatory process again. Thank you. Uh, we have Another question that I'm going to direct to Johan, you actually answered this in part uh, with your introductory comments, but you may want to expand upon it. David DeYoung asks on Facebook, how do we tie together what you are saying to the free market theories and practice uh, of Milton Friedman? Uh, well, Almost everything I'm saying, I got it from Milton Friedman, so it wouldn't be too difficult to tie together, I think. <laughs> um, I think his point uh, is incredibly important, that there is an invisible hand in the market, as Smith pointed out, but there's also an invisible foot in government <laughs> bureaucracy, uh, constantly uh, reversing the market process where you seek individual gain and you create public benefit in these bureaucracies often you really search for public benefits uh, but you end up giving powers to those who have most stake and uh, earn the most if they manage to capture the regulatory process so what what friedman did more than just generally sort of encouraging innovation and um and and then and then the free market was to look at the um the government failures that exist in any kind of attempt in implementing regulation uh, using many of the chicago schools insight and insights from uh, george stiegler and from the public choice school and and other uh, areas where you see that even if you could find optimal regulations they're often in most cases distorted by the invisible foot of uh, of the government of, of rent seekers in in business and um, therefore by the way i would add that apart from the incentives for businesses and for bureaucrats which creates problem there's a third major i would almost say villain in the story and, and that's actually economists economists who only look at models of uh, at least uh, potential market failures and dream up a perfect regulation that would solve it on paper without thinking about the real life and the real human beings that would have to implement this and the kind of distortions that would ruin those potential gains in most instances. That's what I think that Friedman would have added tonight. Thank you. So this next question I will direct to Patrick. Dave R. asks, uh, defending the regulators, uh, the regulations weren't imposed arbitrarily, he says, but as a result of real problems. For example, many women died 
from exposure to radium as they painted dials on watches. So what is the alternative to regulations? Or are people just going to have to die to allow progress? And you did touch upon this in your documentary with uh, the discussion of thalidomide. Yes, it's a great question. I think that, you know, getting into the, the, the thematic component of the pessimists versus the optimists, uh, to a certain extent, the, the world is a dangerous place. And if this is definitely much more apparent as you look backwards in history and looking at people's lives and what they faced, uh, the really heroic people who, uh, you know, were, were alive at the time of the Industrial Revolution and contributed to it, uh, our lives are vastly different now. Uh, than theirs, part, due in part to their contributions. And so I, I think that it's tough to say what future regulation should look like based on past examples. Uh, and more, the guide should be values driven. Uh, there's always, there's not going to be perfect safety. If there's perfect safety, we will stagnate. And there is a danger to stagnation. Uh, you know, the world is not perfect as it is uh, there. Uh, you know, it's it's sort of the engine of innovation in our economy are pushing forward and innovators are, you know, in this decentralized form of the market looking to find solutions. And regulators to me, uh, you know, when we talk to them, uh, particularly Susan Dudley, uh, you know, have an idea that, that good regulators are really looking as though they're on the team of the innovator. And they ideally should be facilitating uh, their work. Uh, innovators, all the innovators we met in the film are, you know, not what you might expect. Oh, wow, I have a, I, I can, if I sell cultured meat, gets out there, I'm going to be a trillionaire. Uh, you know, there wasn't really a big concern about money, like they're going to get rich. They need money to do something amazing, which is why they're into doing it at all. So there wasn't really a big impulse that I found in the innovators we talked to that was this cutthroat, greed is good, typical businessman uh, portrayal in Hollywood. It was more, we're trying to do something good and amazing, and we certainly don't want to hurt people or poison people uh, in the least. And so <clears throat> I think that, you know, ultimately there, there we probably have just skewed too far into the risk averse, uh, you know, sense that the world is this place that has to be perfect and protect us from everything. Uh, which we, we need people protecting us and we need the regulation, but we need to realize that uh, in order for progress uh, to be made and for human lives to be better, there's simply the fact that risk is required to do so. Thank you. Another question for you, Patrick. Anonymous asks, will this program be an international model? By which I think he means, are you considering uh, releasing this documentary in other languages or international versions? Uh, yeah, well, I want to take that that question in two directions. One, will it be available internationally? Yes, will it be an international smash? hopefully. Uh, but uh, yes, it will be available internationally. Uh, we, you know, right now we're doing, uh, in terms of distribution, educational screenings, we've done, uh, I think, 60. We also want to mention that on our website, you can see a set of four crowdcasts we did, which sort of functions as our premiere, which got canceled because of COVID. Um, we have Sonny Perdue, Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Andrew Wheeler, Secretary of EPA. They all watched our movie. There's very engaging Q&A sessions there if you want to follow and find out more about the story. Um, in terms of the, I want to really just set this up for you, Johan. Uh, so one of the things that we found is that our regulatory system itself is an export. <laughs> so a lot of other countries, when we were asking innovators, like, where can you go? 
uh, it was sort of like, well, wherever we go, they've been there before us. And so whatever the Americans recommended, it's often how they set it up there. So, so in that way, the regulatory system is, uh, is, a, is a really terrible export that we have going on right now. Do you want to comment on that, uh, Johan? Well, no. Uh, the only thing is that, yeah, we blame you for a lot, lots of stuff that has happened in the, <laughs> the last few decades around the world. <laughs> That's one of them. <laughs> All right. Um, Anonymous asks, uh, and I think this uh, could be answered by either one of you. Maybe Johan wants to go first. Uh, Anonymous says, first, wonderful discussion. Thank you. I think the challenge of our age is the explosion of data and use of AI techniques to put it to use. It will produce wonderful benefits, but also harm. How should we regulate for privacy and data security or shouldn't we? Yeah, that opens up a can of worms. Um, I, I think that this is a typical example of where we don't want to regulate in advance too much because we don't know yet what's the best version of uh, having data and the, and the free flow of data and where to, to limit it yet. And that's something that will, I think, happen when we start to behave, uh, reveal preferences in our behavior, in our negotiations uh, between uh, companies and other things. I know there are many parts to of this question, but but the one thing about data and, and who owns the data, well, you know, that's really something uh, that, sorry, that's our cat uh, just trying to interfere with our discussion here. Um, we, we do own our data. We decide on where to go, which websites, which companies to hand over our trust and our information. And perhaps we haven't made a very conscious choice in every aspect and we haven't read uh, all the, the contracts that we've signed. I've read somewhere that if you really read everything that you sign away every day, it would take some 25 years of your life and no one wants to do that. Um, but if this starts to worry us, there are things that we should and could do. There would be a market uh, that would be created for potential um, uh, brokers of information, uh, whom we basically information banks, just like we handed over our savings to banks and uh, financial institutions. We would do it to a trusted uh, data bank, which we pay uh, for our data, and then that broker would be involved in every decision that we make online, where to go, what to do. When when we sign up to Facebook, there's a, a couple of microseconds of negotiations between our broker and the company on, do I agree to those terms? Or if not, I will skip it. And if a sufficient number of people skip it, then Facebook would change their uh, their behavior. That's uh, we don't know the perfect balance yet, and that will take a long time to figure out. I have no idea, and I know that a bureaucrat in a, an institution far away from these decisions have no idea, and it's something that has to happen on the market because of our decisions and of our negotiations. And then later on, governments can step in to protect us and those agreements and uh, the ownership uh, structures that we've created. But it's very difficult to do it in advance. Everything is based on trial and error, feedback, mistakes, and new adaptation, and new trial and error. And that's uh, the theme of the documentary. So that may be a great note to uh, end on since we are slightly over time now. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated. We had a lot of truly uh, wonderful and thought provoking questions come in and I apologize that we could not get to all of them due to our limited time. Uh, the video recording of the event will be available on Cato's uh, web page tomorrow. If you haven't seen it yet, as a reminder, uh, please be sure to check out the documentary. 
they say it can't be done. Again, you can find the link and password to watch the documentary by visiting cato.org slash live. That's cato.org slash live. The link and password will be posted in the chat box. It is a fantastic film that I greatly enjoyed, and I hope that this discussion this evening inspires many more of you to uh, give it a watch and spread the word about it. Thank you.